Good afternoon. Since everybody was chatting, we'll get right into our program. I didn't interrupt you to give you um, your soft opening. Hopefully you had enough time to discuss things amongst yourselves, though. Um, we'll get right into it today with Jane and our invocation and pledge. If you all would please stand for the invocation and pledge. And so, of course, as a veteran, the daughter of a veteran, the spouse of a veteran, the mother, stepmother to a veteran, um, of course, veterans are near and dear, so we're going to continue that thing this morning. Let's pray. Dear God, we are so thankful for the many thousands of Americans who have taken the oath to serve our country. They are our protectors of peace at home and abroad. We are so thankful for them for their courage and bravery. And we pray especially this morning as Rotarians who seek peace for wisdom to our world leaders. The challenges are amazing. And we pray that they turn to you to do the right thing, to do the, the right action with integrity, with compassion, with truth. We also want to remember the families of our service members. Of course, the service members are over there deployed, doing what we ask them to do. At home are their spouses, the children, the parents, who all deal with not having that special person in their lives at difficult times. So we are thankful for all of those who support our many service members and pray that you will be with them as they approach difficulties and find the right solutions. We ask that you continue to give our service men around the world courage, strength, and comfort. We thank you for this food. Bless it so that we too can go out and serve. In God's name, amen. We'll say the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, the nation indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Good afternoon, Greenville. Mary Cadero here. I have the honor this afternoon of introducing our guests. When your name is called, please stand and remain standing until everyone has been addressed. Laura Allen Curlin, and she is a guest of the club. And we have a visiting member today, David Goff. David, what club are you from? Where are you from? Well, welcome. Did I miss anybody? Okay. Well, uh, good afternoon, or good, good, good lunch day. My name is Jim Perea, and I serve as committee chair for the CART Fund for the club. I feel like that every now and then we need to refresh our minds on what the CART is all about or why you're being asked to put in money every week, every every meeting. And also, there, I'm sure some new members here are really not familiar with what it is that why we ask you to dig in your pockets. But <clears throat> CART is a rotary-based organization. It was founded 28 years ago at the Sumter, South Carolina Rotary Club. It was founded to help to find a cure for Alzheimer's. Now, Alzheimer's, as many of you know, is a dread disease. There are 67 million cases of it in the United States at this very time. And we lose 120,000 people each year because of Alzheimer's. It's the seventh rank disease for cause of death. Now, the philosophy of this program is <clears throat> that we needed to find a way that Rotarians can be directly involved in the cure, for, help for the cure of Alzheimer's without trying to interfere with our local club projects uh, or the Rotary Foundation. Therefore, as you'd see, it was kind of an easy thing just to drop money into the bucket. Or, as it started out, was called Coins for Alzheimer's Research Trust. We just dropped you. The idea was to put your change in there, and now coins almost don't exist. 
So you can put in folding money now if you like to, and even have a QR, QR code on the bucket if you want to use that. Now, the CART uses these funds collected uh, to provide research grants by outstanding researchers in the field of all timers, people who are on the cutting edge, who are pioneers in all times, who can discover. And I may add that this being a, shall we say, a grassroots kind of foundation where we can control the money. It's, these grants are very important to these researchers because they have more flexibility with them as opposed to when you got tied up with a federal grant, as I was not in all times and other things, you, you really are more restricted. But that is the nice part about that. Now, the breadth of the uh, card is that there are 25 rotary districts which involved in it with 440 clubs participating. We, we take in each year about a million dollars. And 100% of all these funds collected uh, everything in the bucket goes into research, and it's hard to keep to operate uh, uh, a uh, private, I mean, uh, a fundraiser without a certain amount of administrative cost, but they've been able to work around that primarily through volunteers. Now, since the program was founded, there have been 64 grants awarded in the 28 years for $11 million, and they have gone to outstanding research institutions like Emory, uh, Harvard, the Salk Institution, places like that. Now, I had the privilege of serving as the vice president for CART in general for a number of years and coordinated or collected the research grants every year and got them distributed accordingly. Now, the vice president is Dr. Gary Goforth from down to Greenwood. Many of you know him because he was district governor of this, uh, of this district. He was an, a retired MD now. But uh, they collect these, they send out notices to all the research institutions in the country that focus on all timers, get back about 30 grants. And from that, three uh, research, outstanding researchers, one from Emory, one from University of Pittsburgh, one from uh, Rush Institute uh, University. They, these three top people select the grants from those 30 applications and give grants that uh, amount to about uh, $250,000 per up to that much. So as you can see, it's a very efficiently run organization. Uh, so empty, empty your pockets, however, whether it's change or, or funding. And uh, I may say on a personal note that I have always been one of these people that says, well, this will never affect me. Well, when the Grim Reaper came knocking on our family door and has robbed my wife of her golden years, I got a little more attention on just how personal these kind of things can be. And so uh, please keep in mind this project that doesn't interfere with any others, but is very effectively used. Thank you for the time. Greenville's most fun and exciting holiday event, the Kringle Holiday Village, is back at Floor Field. See Floor Field transformed into a beautiful European holiday market. Enjoy shopping for handcrafted art, food, and other items from over 40 local vendors. Visit our authentic beer garden for craft beer, live entertainment, games, and more. The Kringle Holiday Village is made up of the best local artisans, so your gifts are sure to thrill. Don't forget to visit Santa and have a blast with activities for the whole family. Make lifelong memories, start new traditions, and celebrate old ones with family and friends as you experience the warmth and charm of the Kringle Holiday Village. Brought to you by the Rotary Club of Greenville. Get your tickets online at KringleHolidayVillage.com. Woohoo! We're so glad we could share with that. Many of you know all about Kringle Holiday Village. In fact, you live it for at least a whole weekend. And there are others of you who are new members, so we wanted to make sure you got a little taste of what we talk about when we're always talking about Kringle Holiday Village. So, you know, it has a million different aspects to it. And one of them is our silent auction. So some of you may be thinking already, <clears throat> Ah, the silent auction, I don't have anything to donate. I'm not really interested. But silent auctions are a thing. A couple years ago when we had our first one, we had people that 
go on, because we use a, a computerized website, they go and search out silent auctions and they look at items that they want and they're from East Tennessee and they bought two items, thanks to uh, Charles Little, who I think is here, two things that he donated and they bought from East Tennessee and they drove down here and picked them up two hours away. So it is a thing. Um, and just re recently, at I think I saw Ryan Brown. Yes, um, at our great event at Center Stage, I was talking to your lovely wife, and guess what? She loves silent auctions. <laughs> <laughs> so this is not just for you, but we want you to share it with your family and your friends and to get people going on there now so they start bidding so we can get the prices higher and higher and higher and we can make a lot of money. Because just like uh, Kringle Holiday Village, the proceeds go to uh, all our wonderful charities that we do. So back to the actual silent auction. Um, you need to go in there and look because we have some great trips. Jenny's gone to the trouble to pick out a lot of great trips for us. Um, you can go to the beach and play golf. You can go to the West Coast and ride bicycles down the West Coast. You can go to Cabo or some other wonderful exclusive places. And these um, trips, many of them you can go ahead and purchase at a set price now, or you can start bidding. And some of them you can do multiples. So if you would like to take your family, brothers, sisters, their spouses, your um, uh, kids, whatever you want to do. And there are lots of fun things for kids. I think there's a, a year's worth of online children activities that is rated super high. So there are really great things like that. Um, we have some tickets for Peter Pan at the Peace Center and other wonderful things like that. We'll have some food options, some up more shows, and just great things. So keep going on there. And some of you may have talents or access to great experiences that you would like for us to add. So you can um, go. There are several ways you can do it. You can. Uh, we'll send you a form that's available um, through our a Rotary website where you can donate an item to the silent auction, or you can go to the website. There's going to be a test. You can go to the website and donate a silent auction. You can also go to the website to buy items from the silent auction. So um, we're looking forward to that. And if you have something to donate, you can go to the website, or you can contact me if you want to put something on the silent auction. And um, we are using a wonderful software, but part of the software um, also does our Kringle loot, which Brett's going to talk about. So you need to go to the website, Silent Auction, Kringle loot, okay? Remember, there's going to be a test. Yes, yeah, so we're very excited about Kringle loot. This year, we've rebranded our 50-50 raffle and um, had some generous uh, rot Rotarians step forward, and we've got a $1,000 pot already. So uh, really hopeful and um, really ask you all to please um, consider participating. We've, we're sharing it on social media and getting the word out. But, um, you know, the, the truth is you got to go on and, and sign up on the website. And I guess I can I yeah. stop to you. Um, but get, get signed up. And once your information's in there, all you have to do is put your phone number in. It makes it really easy to go in and bid on items and, and buy tickets for the raffle. So thank you. Okay, so as you know, we still have a whole lot of things to do with Kringle. And people, some people in your mind, you're putting it, that's after Thanksgiving, that's Christmas, but we only have how many days, Roger, is it? It's like 20? Yeah, so the days are flying by and we got a lot to do. So just to make sure that everybody's clear, if you want to donate something for the silent auction, you're going to go to the website. If you want to buy something from the silent auction, you're going to the website. If you want to um, buy a chance to win Kringle loot, and the more we start buying now, the bigger the pot's going to be, so the better for everybody, you're going to go to the website. If you want to be a sponsor, it's never too late. We need your companies to be a sponsor or other people. You're going to go to the website. If you want to be a friend of Kringle, maybe you don't quite have $2,500 or more to be a sponsor, but your company or you personally would like to go ahead and donate $100, $250, $500, you can go to the website. Um, and then, of course, Jeremy. Jeremy has done an awesome job of setting up our whole volunteer program. And how many volunteer slots are there, Jeremy? 
Okay. <laughs> yes. And it's not just for you. It's for your family, your friends who want to do community service, for your high school kids, if you know other high school kids. But if you want to volunteer, all you have to do is go to the website. And then, of course, the most important thing that we want to share and all this, um, we need you to come to the Kringle social media, to our club social media, share all this stuff on social media. But we want everybody to buy tickets, right? And last but not least, the great place to go to buy tickets is the website. Thank you. Very oh, one last thing. We have lots of information at this table up here. So before you leave, um, Roger will find you $10 if you do not stop by this table and pick up some, <laughs> some cards or some flyers that we can put up around town. Just take them and pass them out to everybody you know. So thank you. I'm really upset I don't have any stomping in my presentation, so I might have to challenge you to jumping jacks or something. I want to give you a few uh, updates on foundation at the end of the year. If you're like me, you're looking at uh, the end of December and thinking about your year in giving for tax purposes, and so I want to make you aware of a few things going on. But before I do, I want to invite you to a little thought experiment that I heard recently. If you think about all the human beings who have lived on this earth for all of human history, over thousands of years, right? I would suggest to you that to have been born, as I think all of you were, in the second half or thereabouts of the 20th century in the United States of America is to have won the absolute jackpot of life. The benefits and advantages we have are just extraordinary. And there is no rich and poor in this room. They are rich and they're richer still. And that's the reality if you compare yourselves to all those people. So you may not be a Bill and Melinda Gates donating billions of dollars to Polio Plus. But here's one of the things you can do this month and through the end of the year. Our uh, great district Rotarians, Doug and Sally Kaufman, are matching any gifts to Polio Plus up to $100, up to $40,000 at the district level. And then beyond that, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation is going to double that amount. So your $100 gift to Polio Plus turns into $600. That's remarkable. I'd take that investment right now if anybody's offering out there that's a financial planner. So that's a great opportunity for you. Another thing to make you aware of, our foundation celebration dinner is at uh, the first day of uh, next month on Friday, December 1st at the Marriott. We'll be celebrating the remarkable accomplishments of foundation giving this past year. Uh, Pam and Terry Weaver will be receiving award, an award that has only been given out twice before in our district, so it's going to be a special night. Tickets are $65, and it's at the Marriott on Parkway East. I'd really encourage you to come to that if you can. And then finally, as I mentioned last time I got up for the foundation, we will be doing matching points in December. And not only would your giving to Polio Plus count towards Paul Harris Fellow status, but any dollars given in December will also be matched by Paul Harris points from our club. So if you are close to a new Paul Harris status level or close to being a, a Paul Harris Fellow, that'll be your opportunity. Be looking for an email from Jenny that lets you know exactly where you are and how much you would need to get give to get to that next Paul Harris Fellow level. So thank you all very much. Think about the foundation in your year in giving. I'm very pleased to be able to introduce our speaker today, L Lieutenant Colonel Retired Mike Ware. And Mike is a West Virginia native. He graduated from West Virginia University with a Bachelor of Science and continued his education at Troy State where he got a master's in public administration. He has 21 years in the US Air Force, which I just have to remark, you know, People always say that. I mean, I say I'm a veteran of the U.S. Army. You know, what Air Force do they think he might be a veteran of? The Bangladesh Air Force, the Argentinian Air Force. But, you know, you'll never say, nobody will ever say he's a veteran of the Air Force. He's a veteran of the Army. You know, as if there's any doubt what country. But he's a veteran of the, in case for anybody that thinks it was Bangladesh, it wasn't. And it wasn't Argentina. It was the United States Air Force. So he has 3,400 flight hours. I want to put that in perspective because 3,400, well, we all know what an hour is. 3,400 flight hours is equivalent to taking off today 
and staying aloft for 141 continuous days, not landing for 100. I mean, we have astronauts that don't have that much time off of the earth. Think about it. But then after he did that, he spent from, he spent, let's see, five, he spent 18 years with a FedEx, as, with FedEx as a pilot flying the Boeing 727 and the D, DC-10. So that 141 days, he's maybe got a year. You know, they, they say you get younger. Einstein said that you get younger if you go toward the speed of light. I mean, you know, that I think he's the equivalent age of like 25 years old, you know, because he's gone back in time. He does a lot of volunteer work with churches and veterans organizations um, and does great work there. He also makes a number of public presentations, which is so important because Frankly, we don't have in our society today enough families that have members of their family that are serving or have served. And it's important that we tell these stories again and again and again to keep our population informed as to the armed forces of the United States that protect us, that are so important to us. He's got a book that he's written uh, that is a fabulous book. I have it. And... Uh, it's called Forever Young. He's going to be selling it out there after this meeting for $20. Uh, that's basically the cost to publish it. 100% of your money goes to veterans organizations. He doesn't keep a nickel of it. And you can do all your Christmas shopping today. And any of you that don't want to read it, buy a copy and donate it to the silent auction for Kringle Village. So you got no excuse. You can buy it for yourself. You can buy two copies, one for yourself and one for the silent auction of website, Kringle Village. So we want to do that. Uh, Mike is married, lives in Traveler's Rest with his wife of 46 years, has three married children, 10 adorable grandchildren. Thank you for all you do for our veterans. Thank you for your service. Thank you for coming to our club. Please, we look forward to hearing you. Well, I'm a walker, so uh, and a talker, as you'll find out. But I, I don't know whether you all have uh, attended Bob's uh, operation over there, the uh, military lecture series at the Poinsett Club. But if you haven't, put it on your list. He does an absolutely fabulous job, and uh, he gets a good audience. In fact, the matter is, I asked him about this audience. I said, "Hey, can you just give me a little bit of background on you guys?" And he said, "Well, Mike, they're all the movers and shakers in Greenville." And quite frankly, they don't have time for boring or long-winded speeches. So if that happens, they're just going to get up and walk out in the middle of your speech. And I hope that doesn't upset you. And I said, Bob, I'm a fighter pilot, as you told. We fighter pilots have this trait. Some people call it a flaw. We've got big egos. In fact, the matter is my ego is so huge. If all of you got up and left, I would consider that your problem. I would continue to speak and I would truly enjoy my speech. So if you do need to go, feel free uh, uh, to go. We're going to talk about uh, a couple of those things. And I talk about the uh, price of freedom, and uh, Bob mentioned it. We only have, uh, uh, well, 93% of the people in the U.S. has never served in the military. And so we like to get civilian audiences and let them hear these stories from under the hat. And you'll see why I talk about under the hat. But before we get there, I want to make sure you know, if there's other veterans in here, that we know we don't have the patent on this thing called service and patriotism. And even back in the 1830s, whenever uh, Alexis de Tocqueville came through and he wrote a book that nobody's read, but he's got a lot of good quotes in it. One of them is which one of the pillars of this democracy that he was looking at was the fact that ordinary citizens would band together in small, medium, and large group for the common good. And that's what made this democracy so strong. Well, in 1905, a bunch of common citizens joined together up in Chicago. And that operations now has, what, 46,000 of you all? It's got 1.4 million people, plus all the ones that have done that service beforehand, talking about integrity and, and clean uh, water down in, the, in Honduras. And every aspect of the community that you've been involved in, you see the need of your community, you see the need of your state, you see the need of the nation and the world, and you stepped up to meet that need. And as a, as a veteran, I salute you for your patriotism and your service. Thank you. About 10 years ago, I took this picture. And uh, shortly after uh, 
that lady stepped off the stage, a smartly dressed man come out, and he introduced himself as the executive director of the American Cemetery in Normandy, France, where we stood that day with, Ohom uh, with Omaha Beach just down over the cliff from there. He addressed the 13 World War II veterans that were sitting in the wheelchairs in front of us, and he looked at them, and after a short introduction and a little bit about what uh, goes on over there, he looked at them and he said some words that I'd, I'll never forget. He said, uh, heroes, whenever you turn and you go into this hallowed ground, you will see do not enter tape around a large portion of areas close here. He said, we're having a Memorial Day ceremony in about two weeks, and we want it to look pristine because we'll have over 100,000 people here on the premises, plus the millions that's going to look at it. He said, but if you hear no other words that I say the rest of the day, those do not enter signs do not apply to you. Because your blood, your sweat, your tears, and those that live with us 24-7 under the grave markers that you see out there has earned the right, and they own every piece of grass that's in this place. So if you need to stand, or you need to kneel, or you need to lay to support your comrades, you do that. They do not belong to you. So I put my hands on the guy that's to the draw's right second there. And his name was, well, I'll, let it, I'll tell you what. I'll just, he, I was who I was uh, escorting that day. I'll just let him tell you about his story. I'm Vince Rowell. I stormed Normandy Beach on B-Day, June 6, 1944. I was scared to death for one thing. I think any man that says that, that he wasn't would be telling us a story about it because we didn't really know whether we were going to make that beach safely or be pushed back out into the water. Machine gun fire. We could see where it was coming from, but we it was hard for us with just rifles to try to uh, knock those machine guns out. It take a little bit more than that. And I seen so many men falling around me from that, that machine gun fire. And it, it was really frightening. And I never seen so much devastation in my life of human bodies. The channel, English Channel, is a beautiful blue body of water. But it was totally red, blood red that day. And I actually had to take my legs and push the bodies aside to keep moving forward. And I heard the cries of the men that hasn't, hadn't died yet, saying, Mama, I need you, Mama. And that's really touching me to hear that. I'll never forget that. I fought all the way from the beaches of France to uh, that stone at the Battle of the Bulge, and I never had a, a, a Two and a half years of combat, never had a mattress to slip and put my body on, I never had a pillow to go under my head. And that's the kind of life you live. You just live out in the wild open, in the wide open, just like a wild animal living out there. I think about these things. And I see shed many a tear when I'm alone by myself. I can't get over this. I'll never get over it. It'll be in my mind to the day I close my eyes and live. And I still love this country. And I would die for it if I had to. I was Vince's seatmate for 10 hours flying from the States over there. I figured I'd get a little sleep. I got eight hours of World War II stories. Riveting the whole way. So when we turned around and we started walking, silence was okay. Like we all knew. Because just over that hill, on the first day after the first day, Vince looked back down and 2,000 of his countrymen were laying there who are laying there now. Vince would go on. He told you where he went on uh, uh, to fight in the war. But what he didn't tell you is he ended up at the concentration camp of Dachau. And he helped <clears throat> liberate that. And he described it as a thousand skeletons looking back at him. And he'll never forget that. A couple days later, we were at a place called Point de Hoc. If you're not familiar with Point de Hoc, you see the big guns behind us. There was four big guns there that was wreaking havoc on Vince and the other ones that are landing until 
a bunch of Army Marine, I mean, Army Rangers scaled a 100-foot a, a cliff under heavy fire to take them out. I was escorting actually the guy in the wheelchair. If you want to know the other guys there, one right next to me, he was a POW built out of a B-24 over the end. The guy next to him, Special Forces, was a drone pilot, D-Day, delivering troops behind the lines. He escaped and he evaded back out. He led the uh, extraction team that got a Warner von Braun and brought him into the Allied uh, uh, territory. The guy beside of him was a tank commander for uh, Patton. Uh, unfortunately, he was in Bastogne waiting on his tank whenever they got surrounded. So he got to be in the facility when General McAuliffe replied nuts to the surrender ceremony. And I asked him how he felt. He goes, we knew it was going to be a long couple of days. The guy next to him was a flight engineer out of Newfoundland. He delivered airplanes to Europe. The other guy's a, a Navy guy who uh, was uh, on the uh, cruisers and the carriers down in the South Pacific. But uh, Harlan Lentz, the guy in the wheelchair, I had to push him through all those rocks and stuff that day. I happened to look over, and here was a family looked like a three people following us. Uh, a man and a woman about 50 years old and a beautiful young lady about 30. Not that I noticed that stuff at my age. But anyway, all of a sudden, I feel this peck on my shoulder, and it's the young lady. And she says, can I talk to him? And I said, oh, he would love that. So she goes around, and she takes his hands, and she says, you're a CB. Uh, can you tell me your story? And if you don't know what a CB is, it's a construction guy for the Navy. And he had done it in the South Pacific, and he ended up on Okinawa, where he was he was building an airstrip whenever the bomb went off and the war ended. He stayed there for a few, four, few more months for the uh, occupation stuff. And she looks at him and she says, well, I'm a CB and I just got back from a year in Afghanistan. And he goes, ooh, tell me your story. And she did. And they got a hug. She left. She was crying. I walk around and I say, Harlan, how about them apples, buddy? He looks at me and he goes, well, I'll tell you one thing. I got all the CBs too early. They did not look like that in World War II said, you dirty old man. Anyway, uh, he goes, but you know what? That was so inspiring to me. He said, because that's not what we see on TV. What we see on TV is people tearing up the flag, people wanting the very thing that we fought against. And it was so refreshing to see a young person with the same morals, the same patriotism, the same courage that we had in World War II. A couple days later, we're in the Ardennes. That's uh, Bastogne, Battle of the Bulge. And uh, after we left uh, Bastogne, we'd come up to the Ardennes floors. Forest was what's there. And, and they maintained this forest exactly the way it was in, at the front lines of the, of the Battle of the Bulge. And if you're not familiar with that, there was 110,000 Germans surrounding 18,000 Americans. They demanded immediate uh, surrender or they were going to wipe them all out. And that's when the nuts was, uh, he replied nuts. Well, the guy standing there, uh, he was actually a Marine in the South Pacific, and he had made a, several landings on the beaches to include Okinawa, was on the ship ready to invade uh, Japan whenever the, the bomb was dropped. Shortly after that picture was taken, his name's Bob Puckett, by the way, and he taught school to age 97. But anyway, right, right after that, he goes to a perfect attention, perfect salute, and stands there for about a minute. As his hand comes down, he stumbles and almost falls in the double foxhole. I go over and I grab him. I said, Mr. Bob, you doing okay? And he looks at me and he says, well, Mike, you know, I had to come on this trip because I had to see where my classmates, where the people from my town, where the people I knew came and fought and died. And he says, you know, after 70 years, I think I may be able to heal now. 70 years, I may be able to heal all the World War II guys, they came back. They melded back into society. They got another. They had to find something else to do. So what they did is they got a plan and they got their uh, the program together and they started building America into the power that it was. And that trend would continue when, with Korea, Vietnam, and others. When the guys came out of the service, they just put their stuff away. They melded in. They were in your churches. They were in your units. They were in your office. But you never knew it until something like, Veterans Day happens, or Memorial Day, or the 4th of July, and all of a sudden, the hats come out, the coats come out, and you start seeing more and more, and as a flag would go by, you'd see them stand a little straighter, salute a little uh, sharper, sing maybe a little louder, and if you walk up to them and you say, hey, 
thanks for your service. You're actually not thanking him. He considers you to be thanking all those people that he stood upon, all of his buddies that didn't make it back. So it's just not him. But what you'll do is if you happen to say, hey, what did you do? You're going to hear stories under that hat that's ingrained in the brain, that's, that's tattooed in the heart. And there'll be stories of intense training and, and great laughter and festivities, uh, uh, stories that, you know, of, of relationships that's even stronger than family relationships. But you also hear the stories that are terrifying, that are heartbreaking as they held their best friend as he breathed his last breath. But as you know, those stories, and Bob mentioned this, they need to be told continually. They need to be out. The reason for the book that we, we did, they need to be told to beautiful young ladies, and that is my wife, the reason I say that. They need to be told to youngsters, be in the schools, be in to those. Remember, there's only 7% of the population that has been in the military. We've shut down military operations all over the world, so nobody gets to contact them anymore. So they got to tell the stories. The guy down in the bottom, Sydney, I was escorting him through the World War II Museum down in, in uh, New Orleans. And the nice thing about that was, and we were there, there was a bunch of middle schoolers down there and different groups that would walk around. And every time we'd come over with Sydney, Sydney would holler at him and say, come over here. And he gave him a 15 minute lesson on what it was like being a black guy in the Navy in World War II, whenever they tried to make him a cook, as he said, for a bunch of white Southern guys, I wanted to kill Japs. So they made him a uh, munitions guy on cruisers and destroyers. And he went all over the South Pacific. Great guy. He has actually told me he, his wife showed up. He said they'd been married for 75 years. And I said, great. He said, well, we didn't know it. I thought she divorced me 50 years ago. She thought I divorced her. We hadn't. So we've been married for 75 years now. Great stories from under the hat. They do have a thing. I throw this slide in for another reason. Does anybody know where that is? Checkpoint Charlie. The reason I throw it on, Russia's back. Everybody's kind of forgotten about the, the Iron Curtain that went from the North Sea all the way down to the Black Sea. And I flew my F-15 to that uh, wall several times. Berlin, the occupied city, West Berlin, free East Berlin under communist rule. And in 1980, my wife and I, we crawled up, we looked over the Berlin Wall, saw the manicured sand, saw the water, saw the pillboxes with all the machine guns actually pointing to the east, not to the west. They were holding the total people hostage in their own country. We went through Checkpoint Charlie. They got all the fighter pilots off, took our picture for historical purposes. We knew what they wanted them for, and we wanted them to have them. We wanted their admirals and generals looking at our face. That was the, what caused the deterrence, if you remember that. We went in, churches, they were not just shut, they were chained shut, and they had East German guards guarding them shut. So it was not easy to get into them. When you walked around, there was nobody there except the guys that seemed to be following us the whole time we were in there. We saw a uh, cemetery that had 20,000 Russian soldiers buried in it, and you had to wonder why they, what they fought for, because Stalin had killed 20 million of his own people. As we got back to Checkpoint Charlie, we were ready for that barricade to go back up. And as we walked through, you can see the flag there. The soldier went to attention and he says, welcome back to freedom. Welcome back to freedom. You notice the flag. There's a lot of discussion on the flag these days. And sometimes it's not such good discussion. But I just wanted to spend a couple minutes. I've mentioned that as the, as the national, national holidays happen and stuff and the flags come out, you start seeing the the veterans stand a little straighter. And there's a reason for that, because whenever we look at the flag, we see a few things. We see General Washington going across the Delaware River on a, on a terribly cold night. We see the War of 1812. We see brother fighting brother in, in the Civil War. We see the, the gas trenches of World War I, the, the concentration camps and the bombings of World War II. We see the cold mountains of Korea, where my buddy from West Virginia, Jim Brown, he went in on the first expeditionary force at the Pusan perimeter. He went around, did the, uh, the landing with uh, MacArthur all the way up to Seoul, back around. He did Wonsan up to the Chosen, and then he fought out of Chosen at minus 30 degrees, carrying their dead as he went on one road all the way back. And when I got through, he looks at me and he goes, you know, Mike, you need to go down and talk to my buddy, George King. He had a lot worse than I did. And I went, yeah, I don't think so. 
And I went down and talked to George King, and he said, have you talked to Jim Brown? He had a lot worse than I did. And that's the stories you are going to get from veterans. There's always somebody different. So whenever we look at the flag, there's other things we see because it didn't stop with, with uh, Korea. It goes on to Vietnam, where my first squadron commander was shot down over Hanoi and spent five and a half years undergoing a torture nobody should ever have to undergo. And if you talk to him, you say, how did you survive that? He goes, because I had faith. I had faith in my other POWs. I had faith in my country that they would get me back out of there. And I had faith in my Lord that if it didn't work out, I was going to a better place. And if you have faith, you can have hope. And with hope, you can have life no matter what you are doing. Had another buddy that was uh, Taysan, if you're familiar with Taysan. 77 day siege, they were getting pounded by 1,000, uh, 1,500 artillery and mortars and stuff every day for 77 days. And this young corporal in the middle of that gets a note that says, your dad, a B-52 pilot in the Air Force, volunteered to fly bombing missions over Quezon. So every time a B-52 would come over, he'd point up and say, thank you, Dad. Going to the desert, you know, we had Afghanistan and and Iraq, and those, and Kyle Carpenter over there, he's a, he's a corporal in the Marines, and he jumps on a, a grenade to save his fellow, so, uh, his fellow Marines, and he survives. 44 uh, operations later, lots of pain, lots of recovery, and when somebody looks at him and says, thanks for your service, he goes, you were worth it. You were worth it. When we look at the flag, we ask ourselves every day, am I worth their sacrifice? I don't know what you see, maybe you think about that, but that's what a veteran sees whenever he looks at the flag. I'm going to leave you today with another story from under the hat. This guy's name is uh, John, no, John Coon. I met John on a, on a trip of honor, not honor flight, trip of honor. We're honor flight on steroids, but trip of honor to Washington, D.C. When we got there, the founder, whose name's on the front of the book, uh, she asked me if I would be the roommate of this guy. And I said, sure. She goes, well, he's had some medical issues. He's been moved off of his farm. He's in an apartment. He's in his wheelchair. He's depressed. He's just waiting to die. So I take him up to the room and I turn him around. And I said, hey, John, tell me your story. And, no, no, I don't talk about it. I said, John, you may be an axe murderer, man, and I'm going to have to live with you for three nights. I need some sleep. Tell me what you, he goes, axe murderer. And I said, you look pretty, you look pretty innocent, but you never can tell. Well, he looks at me and he goes, okay. Well, John uh, joined the Navy, volunteered to go into the Navy in, in 43. He was sent up to the Great Lakes for training, and he was trained to be a coxswain driver, a pilot. They could deliver Marines to the, to the beach in the Higgins boat, like you saw uh, in, uh, in the uh, video. He was shipped over to, to uh, Hawaii, excuse me, shipped to Hawaii. He joined his mother's ship, and his first, uh, his first action is Tarawa that you see down on the left. It was the most heavily defended island that the Japanese had. They didn't think it could be taken. And uh, on the 20th of no uh, November, 1943, at 8.45 in the morning, John was piloting a Higgins boat toward that island, and the Marines in there were in the middle screaming, we're going to die, we're going to die. And John says, no, I promise you, I'm taking you to this island. I'm going to bring you off of this island. Well, he gets close to it. The high tide did not come in. They hit a, they hit a sandbar. A bunch of the Marines have to jump over the side to let the ship get up to get across the sandbar. Well, many of them did not surface because the water was too deep and they had 100 pounds on their back. It goes on. The ramp goes down as they go off and the ramp is starting to come up. Crossfire, mortar stuff. All he sees are the guys he just dropped off being blown to bits. It goes out and for the next three days, he's delivering fresh Marines and supplies to the beach and he's bringing the injured back to the ships. After that three days, they hand him a shovel. They say, you're in charge of the burial detail. There's about 40 Marines on the beach. You need to go bury him. So he gets a bulldozer, he and a bunch of other guys. They make a mass grave. They bury him with all the honors that they possibly could. They come back to the ship and they leave. John, he didn't get to bring those Marines off of that beach. John goes on, he survives a couple kamikaze attacks. He goes on, he comes back, goes back on his farm and takes his hat, takes his stuff off and goes back into life. So now we're back and he just told me that story. There's tears running down his face. For the next three days, we go out and we tour Washington. I'm pushing him in the wheelchair. 
He gets to hear all the other veteran stories that are in there. He gets to tell his story to veterans and others. And you could just see a weight lifted off, lifted off his, his uh, shoulders. And the last day, I'm standing there ready with his wheelchair. And he, he, he goes, well, you know what? I think I'm going to use it as a walker today. I'm feeling good. I said, really? He goes, yeah, so I'm just going to use it now. I said, so, so I run around and I jump in it. And he said, what are you doing? I said, I've pushed you for three days. The least you can do is push me to the bus. And he does. We became uh, great friends and visit each other, but we would, uh, I could always see there's something different. And he said, I need one more trip. Can Diane set up another trip? He goes, I need to go to the National Cemetery of the Pacific, which is in Honolulu. And if you've never been there, it's an amazing place. He says, if I feel if I get there, I'm at least close to the guys I left on the beach. And we said, yep. So she set up a trip, uh, a trip of honor for him and about 20 other people. They go to there, they get to the, uh, to the, uh, uh, the uh, Pacific there. And as the executive director again comes out and welcomes them, and he goes, you all will see some new graves. He goes, we just got back from the island of Tarawa. And we brought back 40 Marines. They go, whoop, we got a Tarawa, Tarawa veteran. So they go up, and before the guy can say anything, John looks at him and says, were the Marines at this place on the beach? Were they buried this way? Were the coats this way? Were the hats this way? I said, how'd you know that? He goes, I buried him 75 years ago. So they took John, put him in a, in a, uh, a uh, golf cart, and they took him, and he went to every one of those graves and welcomed them back home. When John came back, a totally different guy. He was now free of 75 years later. Well, about three or four months later, I get a phone call saying, John's... Uh, going down fast, he'd like to see you. So I run over to Huntsville, Alabama. I walk into his room. He takes my hand like he always did. And for two hours, we talk about anything and everything. He sang uh, hymns. He had never sung hymns in his whole life, uh, the whole time, but he did there. He asked me to see if I could find some people he needed to say he was sorry for from 70 years ago. I said, I think they probably forgot about that by now, John. You know, but he looked at me and he said, you know, Mike, who would have thought the best five years after the war would be my last five years. Well, he died about two weeks later, and uh, I was I gave part of his eulogy uh, at his funeral. And whenever we went out uh, to bury him at uh, at the burial site, uh, there was an honor guard there. They folded the flag in in thirteen crisp folds. They handed it to his next of kin, which were two uh, nieces. We heard taps play. We heard a twenty-one gun salute. And I think if there's any other veterans in here, I think they will tell you. Uh, what we pray for is whenever the God takes us on our last patrol, as you'll see some stuff out there, it's an organization that visits people in hospice, veterans in hospice. When we are on our last patrol and when the Lord takes us, we just hope that that, fold, that flag is still folded in 13 crisp folds. That you hear the sounds of 21-gun salute. That you hear taps played for the end of the day. Because if that's true, that means that flag is still flying here. It's still flying on our cemeteries. It's in our courthouses. It's in, it's in our embassies. As a symbol of freedom and courage that this world needs to see as it is now. We just pray that it'll be there because all the pillars that we talk about of justice and, and equal rights and all those are still primary in our country. Because the way they talk now it's not necessarily true. Lest we never forget the sacrifice that has allowed us to eat in here today the way we can eat in here today. And I, as I go here, I just want to once again look at the Rotary Club. I thank you for your patriotism. I thank you for your service to your community uh, as you do it better than about anybody I know. Veterans, if you're here, God bless you. If you're in a, a Vietnam guy, welcome home. And may God bless, may the Lord just continue to God bless the United States of America. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michael, for that wondering talk, wonderful talk about the veterans. And I know we have a lot of veterans in this room, and it was just Veterans Day. Would they all please stand and be recognized? Thank you all for your service. Um, please remember to pass the cart bucket.
Also, um, don't forget everything from the Kringle presentation there. Make sure to consider sponsorships, volunteer, buy tickets to the event, um, get your Kringle loot. And I understand there are some posters up at this table that you may grab and take back to your place of work or anywhere else that you have to display them to get the word out about Kringle, which is coming up. This Thursday, you can sign up to help pack Thanksgiving food boxes at Alexander Elementary. And we did have, Michael, just so you know, sign the book that we will be donating to Alexander Elementary this week. And join us in two weeks for our nonprofit member presentations. And if you'll please stand now. Here's our four-way test of the things we think, say, or do. Is it the truth? Is it fair to all concerned? Will it build goodwill and better friendships? Will it be beneficial to all concerned? Meeting adjourned.